During the summer, fall, and winter of 1846, a group of volunteer soldiers made one of the longest infantry marches in history across the southwestern desert of the United States, across the Rocky Mountains, to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Even after many years, these volunteer patriots realized that their service to God, country, and family helped to secure a vast new territory for their country through their march, the March of the Mormon Battalion. I am lonesome since I crossed the hill and o'er the moor and valley. Such heavy thoughts my heart to fill since parting with my Sally. While yet in Nauvoo, the High Council of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints made public announcement of the saints' intention to remove to some good valley of the Rocky Mountains. Church authorities had commissioned Jesse C. Little to seek aid from the national government in Washington, instructing him, if our government shall offer any facilities for emigrating to the western coast, embrace those facilities if possible. Elder Little hoped to contract with the government for the saints to haul freight to the Pacific, or perhaps to build block houses and stockade forts on the road to Oregon. Colonel Thomas L. Kane of Philadelphia used his influence to open the way for Elder Little to meet with President James K. Polk on June 3, 1846, shortly after the United States had declared war on Mexico. The death of several American soldiers in a skirmish over the disputed border between Texas and Mexico had given President Polk an excuse to seize the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. The government was now recruiting a great army of the West at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So it was arranged for Brother Little to raise troops instead of stockades. Colonel Kane accompanied him as far as St. Louis, carrying orders to Colonel Stephen W. Kearney, commanding the troops at Fort Leavenworth. Colonel Kearney sent Captain James Allen to the camp of the Saints to enlist volunteers. He was instructed to enlist no more than 500 Mormon volunteers. They were to constitute not more than one-third of the troops under Colonel Kearney's command. It was feared that with greater military strength, the Saints would join forces with the enemy in retaliation for their many persecutions. If the politicians in Washington doubted the Saints' loyalty, Brigham Young did not. The question might be asked, is it prudent for us to enlist to defend our country? If we answer in the affirmative, all are ready to go. Suppose we were admitted into the Union as a state and the government did not call on us. We would feel ourselves neglected. Let the Mormons be the first to set their feet on the soil of California. So the Mormon battalion was enrolled at Council Bluffs. By this time, Colonel Kane had arrived to assist. Upon mustering the fourth company of the battalion, Captain Allen became Lieutenant Colonel of Infantry. Brigham Young predicted that not one who enlisted would fall by the hand of the nation's foe, that their only fighting would be with wild beasts. He assured the volunteers that their families would be cared for. Nevertheless, Sergeant William Hyde expressed the feelings of many of them when he wrote, The thoughts of leaving my family at this critical time are indescribable. They were far from the land of the nativity, situated upon a lonely prairie with no dwelling but a wagon, the scorching sun beating upon them with the prospects of the cold winds of December, finding them in that same bleak, dreary place. My family consisted of a wife and two small children who were left in company with an aged father and a mother and a brother. The most of the battalion left families, some in care of the church and some in care of relatives. When we were to meet with them again, God only knew. Nevertheless, we did not feel to murmur. Brigham Young and the church authorities gave them good counsel before they departed. Daniel Tyler, the battalion's historian, recorded... On condition of faithfulness on our part, our lives should be spared. Our expedition should result in great good, and our names should be held in honorable remembrance for generations. They instructed the officers to be as fathers to the privates, to remember their prayers, to see that the name of the deity was revered, and that virtue and cleanliness were strictly observed. Brother Brigham advised the battalion to treat all men with kindness 
and never to take that which did not belong to them, even from their worst enemies, not even in the time of war, if they could possibly prevent it. They were to treat their prisoners with kindness and never take a life if it could be avoided. A farewell ball was held the night before their departure. It was no sad parting, wrote Colonel Allen, and Colonel Kane observed that it was a more merry dancing route than he had ever seen, though their ballroom was of the most primitive kind, a bowery with Mother Earth for a floor. The battalion left on July 19th. A few dozen families accompanied the battalion, the women to serve as cooks and laundresses. The army of that day wore fine uniforms, but the men of the Mormon battalion elected to march in the clothes they had and to leave with their families the year's clothing allowance of $42.50 per man. At Fort Leavenworth, the men of the battalion received their weapons and equipment. The paymaster was surprised that every man could sign his own name to the payroll, whether a $50 a month captain or a $7 a month private. The battalion left Fort Leavenworth on August 12th. Colonel Allen, who had endeared himself to the men, remained behind, desperately ill. The battalion's plan of march was to Council Grove, then up the Arkansas River and across the Cimarron River, a little beyond Fort Mann, following the route taken earlier by Colonel Alexander Donovan to Santa Fe. After traveling for two weeks, they received word that Colonel Allen had died on August 23rd. He was replaced by Lieutenant A.J. Smith, who soon arrived from Fort Leavenworth to lead the volunteers into Santa Fe. Unfortunately for the battalion, Lieutenant Smith brought with him an overbearing manner and Dr. Sanderson, who treated every illness with calomel and arsenic served from the same old iron spoon. By mid-September, the company was overtired and short of water. They had marched long miles across a dreary desert to be rewarded only with brackish water. Daniel Tyler wrote, On the 21st, we traveled 18 miles and camped again in the Cimarron and had to dig in the sand in the bed of the river for water for both man and beast. We continued along the same stream the following day. Both men and teams were failing fast, many completely giving out from exhaustion and sickness. With insufficient rest, inadequate food, accompanied by threats and oaths from both Lieutenant Smith and Dr. Sanderson, the battalion, sick and well, continued the march towards Santa Fe, a distance of 775 miles, finally arriving on October 9th, bruised and limping. 100 hearty cannon salutes cheered the weary soldiers as they plodded into Santa Fe. Colonel Donovan, a friend of the Saints, had ordered the tribute in their honor. But not all who began the march at Fort Leavenworth arrived in Santa Fe. A few weeks before, some of the families who accompanied the soldiers were sent north to Pueblo, where a small colony of Mormons from Mississippi had already established a winter camp. In Santa Fe, 86 men were pronounced too sick to continue, and they were also sent north to Pueblo, along with the rest of the families five wives remained with the battalion. And in Santa Fe, the battalion members were happy to learn that Lieutenant Colonel Philip St. George Cook would relieve Lieutenant Smith as their commander. Though he too was stern and harsh, he had none of Lieutenant Smith's vindictiveness. Colonel Cook led the battalion out of Santa Fe on the 19th of October and proceeded down the valley of the Rio Grande. Their orders now were to open a wagon road to the coast hauling wagons which Colonel Kearney had abandoned earlier. Soon, 55 more men, declared too sick to continue the march, were sent back to Pueblo. The battalion continued their journey toward the Gila River. At this point, the battalion numbered only 350 men. In the valley of the Rio Grande, they saw crops watered by irrigation, a system they had first observed at Santa Fe. On December 11th, they were reminded of Brigham Young's prophecy that their only fighting would be with wild beasts. On the banks of the San Pedro River, the battalion was attacked by a herd of wild bulls. Several men and mules were hurt and some equipment was damaged. It was hardly a military encounter, but it was an intense, if brief, battle. 
One happy outcome was that the men now had a fresh supply of beef. In Tucson, Arizona, the battalion faced the enemy for the first time. 200 Mexican soldiers guarded the town with orders to prevent any armed force from passing through. Colonel Cook sent his interpreter, Dr. Stephen Foster, into town in disguise to ascertain whether the battalion could march through without resistance, as the alternate route was 100 miles further. Foster was arrested and put under guard. When he failed to return, Colonel Cook detained as hostages Mexican soldiers encountered on the road, one of whom was reportedly the son of the commander. Once the prisoners were exchanged, Colonel Cook demanded a Mexican surrender. Instead, the Mexican soldiers fled early the next morning, believing the American force to be greater than it was, and the battalion marched through without hindrance. After three more days' journey along what later became the Butterfield Overland Stage Road, the battalion reached the Gila River. They followed the Gila to its junction with the Colorado. Then their journey became even more difficult. Sometimes as many as 15 or 20 men had to help pull a wagon through the deep sand. In their march beyond the Gila River to California, they endured some of the hottest days, the coldest nights, with no water and but little food, according to Daniel Tyler. They ate their exhausted draft animals as they died, wasting nothing, even using the hides to replace their worn out boots. And always they were plagued by thirst. At one period in January, the battalion marched three days without water. At night they sang and played the fiddle to recover their spirits, no matter how distressing their circumstances. By day, they pushed on through the desert, through the mountains, even hewing a passage through the living rock with pick and axe, crowbars and gunpowder when they found a passage too narrow for their few remaining wagons. The wagon road they made is still there. At last, on January 21st, they came to the end of the desert. They had reached California, but they bore little resemblance to a conquering army. At Warner's Ranch, they rested and feasted on good, fresh beef. Colonel Cook reminded them of their military status, though, as he exercised them at drills. Two days later, they took up the march again. Within the week, they saw the Pacific Ocean. Their journey was nearly over. Daniel Tyler exulted in his journal. Oh, the joy, the cheer that filled our souls. None but worn-out pilgrims nearing a haven of rest can imagine. Henry Boyle added, At this enraptured moment, every heart beat with pleasure, every soul was full of thankfulness, every tongue was silent. We all felt too full to give any shape to our feelings by any expression. It has been many a weary day, and we have traveled many a long mile since our eyes have been permitted to gaze upon as lovely a scene. What an expansive view. How bright and beautiful everything looks. On January 29th, the battalion marched down the Soldad Valley into San Diego and camped behind the old mission buildings. The march of the Mormon battalion was completed. But the soldiering was not. The battalion went into garrison duty part in San Diego, part in San Luis Rey, and part in Los Angeles farther north. Here they built Fort Moore, their accomplishments commemorated to this day by this monument near Olvera Street in Los Angeles, California. In San Diego, the men were allowed to accept employment, digging wells, building houses, and making bricks. Probably the first fired bricks made in California were made by members of the Mormon battalion. The citizens became so attached to the battalion that before their term of service expired, they got up a petition to the governor to use his influence to keep them in the service. The petition was signed by every citizen in San Diego. Some did re-enlist for another six months. In Northern California, a few remained to help build Sutter's Mill, where the famous discovery was made that resulted in the gold rush of 1849. The event was recorded by Henry Bigler, a battalion member. When members of the battalion finally joined the saints in the valley of the Great Salt Lake, they brought seeds and cuttings for several new varieties of fruit, grain, and garden produce 
and introduced the irrigation methods they had observed in the Southwest. Their pay helped to fill the empty treasury. In fact, battalion money bought the site of the Miles Goodyear Ranch, where the city of Ogden was later built. This was only one of the many contributions of the Mormon battalion. The march of the battalion is a vital page of the historical expansion of the United States to the Intermountain West and beyond to the shore of the Pacific. They opened roads of great value to the nation and made influential friends for the saints. But above all, their determined self-sacrifice demonstrated an unsurpassed loyalty to their religion, their country, and their people. Country and family helped to secure a vast new territory for their country through their march, the March of the Mormon Battalion. I am lonesome since I crossed the hill and o'er the moor and valley. Such heavy thoughts my heart to fill since parting with my Sally. While yet in Nauvoo, the High Council of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints made public announcement of the saints' intention to remove to some good valley of the Rocky Mountains. Church authorities had commissioned Jesse C. Little to seek aid from the national government in Washington, instructing him, if our government shall offer any facilities for emigrating to the western coast, embrace those facilities if possible. Elder Little hoped to contract with the government for the saints to haul freight to the Pacific, or perhaps to build blockhouses and stockade forts on the road to Oregon. Colonel Thomas L. Kane of Philadelphia used his influence to open the way for Elder Little to meet with President James K. Polk on June 3, 1846, shortly after the United States had declared war on Mexico. The death of several American soldiers in a skirmish over the disputed border between Texas and Mexico had given President Polk an excuse to seize the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. During the summer, fall, and winter of 1846, a group of volunteer soldiers made one of the longest infantry marches in history across the southwestern desert of the United States, across the Rocky Mountains, to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Even after many years, these volunteer patriots realized that their service to God, the government was now recruiting a great army of the West at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So it was arranged for Brother Little to raise troops instead of stockades. Colonel Kane accompanied him as far as St. Louis, carrying orders to Colonel Stephen W. Kearney, commanding the troops at Fort Leavenworth. Colonel Kearney sent Captain James Allen to the camp of the Saints to enlist volunteers. 